So enter one Kenneth Lee Lay. Lay, like our first protagonist of this season, Sam Walton, Lay was born in rural Missouri in 1942 after Walton. His father was a Baptist preacher who ran a general store out in the Missouri countryside. That ended up failing, and Lay grew up very, very poor, but his family believed in education. And when his older sister graduated high school, his family wanted her to go to college. So they moved the whole family to Columbia, Missouri. Wow, it's like literally the same story. It's crazy. Literally, it's the same story. So that she could live at home, which was the only way they could afford for her to attend to go to the University of Missouri at Columbia. Very, very lovely place, which we have now been to multiple times for a capital camp. So she goes to the University of Missouri. Ken would follow in her footsteps, also go to the University of Missouri, where he would discover a lifelong passion for economics. He's a star student in the economics department. He graduates. He goes on to work in the oil industry after he graduates. On the nights and weekends while he's working in the industry, he completes a PhD in economics. And then one day, he gets a call in the uh, mid-1970s from his old advisor from Missouri, his old professor, who just got nominated to the Federal Power Commission, right as all of this deregulation is starting to percolate its way through the government. And so he calls up Lay and says, come join me here in D.C. and help me work through all this with the government and the industry. So Lay ends up serving as the Deputy Undersecretary of Energy in the Department of the Interior, right as these oil shocks are happening and deregulation is starting to be talked about. After a few years, he goes back into industry at Florida Gas, a pipeline company in Florida, as the president and number two operator within the company. So, so far in this guy's career, he sounds like the real deal. He totally is. PhD, economist, civil servant, working in the government, getting DC exposure, going into industry to actually get some operating experience. Grew up in a hard era and sort of like had to fight his way through adversity. Yep. He's never deployed for combat, but during Vietnam, he ends up going into the Navy. He becomes like a naval intelligence officer. Hmm. By all outward appearances, he seems like a real good guy at this point in time. He marries his college sweetheart, you know, true American story. So late 70s, early 80s, he's the number two executive at this natural gas pipeline company in Florida. And in 1982, his former boss had moved over to the big leagues in the energy industry. He'd gone to a company called Transco Energy based in Houston, Texas, which is Silicon Valley of the oil and gas sector. The Silicon Valley of the oil and gas sector, the New York City to the uh, financial industry of the oil and gas sector, everything. If you want to be in energy in America, you want to be in Texas, either in Dallas or Houston, but I think at this point in time... Houston. Probably Houston. Yep. So Lay is now in the big time. And as is fitting for now being in the big time and of the era, he leaves his wife behind in Florida and moves to Houston with his new wife, who was his secretary at Florida Gas. Unfortunately, classic for this story. Classic. This is not the last time we're going to hear something to this effect in people's personal lives in the Enron story. So right as he arrives in Houston at Transco, two things are happening. One, as I've been talking about all along here, deregulation is finally percolating through to industry. Carter signed the Energy Act. It's in full swing. But two, surprisingly here in 1982, energy prices fall for the first time in a decade. So as a result, right after Lay shows up, Transco runs into a problem. It's contracted to buy a whole bunch of oil and gas assets from various producers, various drillers, you know, around Texas and around the country. And those contracts have Transco buying the assets at an ever-increasing price because the prices of oil and gas have only been going up for the last decade. But market prices have just fallen. So they're really kind of in the lurch here. People think the Transco might go under. Lay... Remember, he's a PhD economist, and he's really quite brilliant. He comes up with an idea 
based on all of the economic theory that he knows, he's like, what if we set up a trading market for this oil and gas that we're contracted to buy, and especially in natural gas, which is now deregulated enough that I think we can do this. And rather than us as the pipeline company buying all of this gas from the producers, we'll just operate the pipelines in the middle and we'll make this market. And we'll let the end consumers of the gas, you know, the factories, the utilities, you know, consumers aren't buying this directly, but the utility companies are. We'll let them, through us, trade with the producers and we can create a spot market for energy. This becomes a huge success. This is like a massive, massive innovation. Hmm. And so Transco was doing this. Transco was doing this. So Lay, he becomes like a total industry legend. He pioneers this. So before Transco and Lay, the whole idea of like any form of trading or financialization of energy, of oil and gas, didn't really exist because it was all regulated by the government before then. Right. Not to mention, securitization wasn't a trend even in finance yet. Today, you can securitize anything. We had, of course, in 2008, everyone became familiar with the term mortgage-backed securities. But securitization in the 80s and 90s became all the rage in finance to basically get anything off your books. You could increase the velocity at which a financial company could operate by packaging up risk and selling it to someone else so that you could make new loans off your books or something like that. And of course, this was going to come to energy at some point. But it's important to remember that securitization is still a reasonably new concept, even on Wall Street. Yep. So two things. One, this is not yet securitization of energy assets. This is simply just making a market for the first time between producers and consumers of the energy where they can buy and sell on the spot market. At a real-time appropriate price. Real-time price. Like today, I need energy. I'm going to look at the market that Transco is now making. I am going to buy as a consumer of energy at today's market price. Whereas in the past, it was all long-term contracts that the pipelines had entered into with the producers and then the consumers of the energy would buy it from the pipelines. I see. Okay. So we're like crawl, walk, run here. Crawl, walk, run. Yeah. Yeah. This is crawling. But as I said, this is Lay. This is Lay's baby. Literally, this is the opening of the floodgates. And he was the very perfect person to do this because he had the industry experience. He's now been close to a decade working in the industry. He had the economics training and he had the government experience. He knew that the deregulation was now at the right point. It had trickled out into industry enough that this is possible. So he really was the perfect person to do this. Hmm. So on the back of that, in June of 1984, Lay, remember, he's number two at Transco. He gets poached by another big Houston energy company, Houston Natural Gas, to come over as the CEO, the number one. He's made it to the top. He's made his mark. He is the big shot at this point in Houston. Yep. They were a big publicly traded energy company in Houston, Probably, I want to say like a billion, billion and a half market cap, call it public company. So definitely a great promotion for him, a job to sort of move up in the ranks by joining this other company. But it's not like he's sort of on top of the world yet at this point. He's got bigger competitors that he is dealing with. He does for the moment. <laughs> so then the very next year in 1985, he gets a call from the CEO of one of the larger competitors a company called Internorth, which was not based in Houston, but rather based in Omaha, Nebraska. You know, a few companies based in Omaha, <laughs> Nebraska. Small head office based in Omaha. Exactly. Small head office. Despite being based in Omaha, though, Internorth, at this point in time, no Berkshire Hathaway involvement, is the largest pipeline company in America. And they were relatively conservative, kind of old school in many ways, as we'll see sort of parochial Nebraska company, despite having the largest pipeline in the country. And they were being pursued by the corporate raider. It's so funny how everything is coming together here in the acquired season. The famed 1980s corporate raider, Erwin Jacobs, but not that Erwin Jacobs. I was going to say, I remember reading this and looking it up and being like, okay, good. Woo. It's not our, it's not our Qualcomm Erwin. I first heard about this other bizarro Erwin Jacobs when doing the research for the Qualcomm episode, because every time I type it into Google, I would occasionally get 
hits for some other famous business person that clearly was not like the hero Erwin Jacobs, but the anti-hero Erwin <laughs> Jacobs. So 1980s corporate raider Erwin Jacobs is pursuing Internorth and the CEO of Internorth wants to merge with HNG as almost like a kind of poison pill to like make the combined company too big for Jacobs or any other raider to pursue. So they negotiate a deal. Internorth ends up buying HNG for $2.3 billion, which was a 40% premium to the stock price. Which is big. I mean, usually the floor of what a board will accept is something around 20%, but a 40% premium, they paid a pretty penny to go buy Ken Lay's HNG here. It wasn't quite the case of Minnow swallowing the whale. Like They were closer in size than the Cap City's ABC deal, but definitely Internorth was the bigger company, but it was clear that Lay and the HNG guys were going to be running the show from then on. Hmm. Yeah, I think that Bethany McLean sort of puts it in this way where it's almost like Inner North got hoodwinked, where they knew they were paying a lot, but they knew it was important to get. But then once they started looking at the deal with a couple of months of retrospect, they were like, wait a minute, we gave HNG a lot of board seats and their executives are having a lot of influence on the combined company. And wait a minute, we just gave away the company. Yes. And specifically, this culture clash manifests in the question of where the headquarters for this new company <laughs> is going to be. The old Internorth management team and board members, they of course want to keep the company in Omaha. And all the board members are sort of politically connected in Omaha. They're like, we don't want this company moving to the big city of Houston, taking all these jobs out of Omaha. It's important that the company stays here. And Lay, of course, he's very political. He's very diplomatic. He's sort of willing to say the right things to appease the board. But he has no interest in moving to Omaha. Like he's in the big city in Houston. He's a player in the industry. He's now a Texas oil man. He wants to stay in Houston. Yeah. And to be super clear here, Inner North had a ridiculously valuable hard asset. This is now quoting from Bethany's book. Among its 20,000 miles of pipeline was a genuine prize, Northern Natural, the major north-south line feeding gas from Texas into Iowa, Minnesota, and much of the rest of the Midwest. So this is sort of the first example of someone in Enron land getting the better part of an economic deal, even though on the other side of the deal, there's a real hard asset that has quantifiable value for end users, for customers. Yeah. Eventually, as we'll see, they give up on even caring about that. <laughs> yes. So... Like we're saying, this culture clash between the two companies manifests itself in the headquarters location. So what do they do? They do what any management team and company would do when you're trying to justify your decision to the board. They hire McKinsey and company. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You totally can't make this up. This becomes completely freaking key to the story. Like, no headquarters study, no Enron. <laughs> uh, because... The desk on which this assignment lands is a young, hotshot, superstar junior partner at McKinsey in the Houston office, one Jeffrey Skilling, who had joined McKinsey after Harvard Business School, where he was a Baker Scholar, you know, top 5% of the class. And famously, I think he had quite the reputation there. And I think he was happy to broadcast this story. He got in because the uh, dean of Harvard Business School interviewed him on a trip to Houston. I think Skilling was working in Houston at the time he'd graduated from SMU. And the dean interviewed him and asked him if he was smart. And Skilling replied to the dean, I'm effing smart. And he didn't say it in exactly those words. It's a family-friendly podcast. You know, we're not Jeff Skilling. Although we will actually say the words of some profanity that Skilling utters later because it is absolutely key to the story. Skilling shows up in Omaha to present to the board his findings, which is that obviously the company should be in Houston. Even all the political wrangling aside, it makes sense that the largest pipeline company in the world at that point in time should be based in Houston, not in Omaha. And we should be clear here, there's this interesting thing going on at the time with natural gas where it's sort of perceived as the good guy. And you're already starting to see this American ire toward the dirty big oil and coal 
and natural gas, which is, of course, a previously thought to be useless byproduct of extracting crude oil. You know, you can make gasoline out of it. You can make all this great stuff out of crude oil. And then there's this natural gas, which didn't have great use cases until lots of scientific discoveries and reasons why we all use it to heat our homes now, or, or many people use it to heat their homes. But it was viewed as this sort of like next great frontier of pseudo clean energy. And so it was a place where a lot of people in the energy business wanted to be going. Yes. Oh, such a good point. I'm glad you paused here and we should discuss a little bit. Natural gas had lots of things going for it. One was sort of the environmental, you know, cleaner than oil, you know, all that. Two was that certainly it was the first part of the energy industry to be deregulated enough that you could do interesting things with it. But three, I think probably the biggest tailwind in its favor in America was, you know, you said oil had started to develop this sort of dirty connotation. I think a lot of that was because of OPEC and the oil embargoes. Like, here's this foreign oil that America is dependent on. I mean, even to this day, like, you know, how much are politicians campaigning on reduce our dependence on foreign oil, blah, 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 blah. You know, yeah, all goes back to the 1970s. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting how uh, natural gas was the sort of electric power of its day in terms of perception. It was the Tesla of the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention there's all these just phenomenal other knock-on effects to it. You, know, you can pipeline it. You move it all over the place. You can store it really easily. So you can store lots of energy in a super dense way in case you don't need it in one place, but you do need it in another. It has these great sort of natural properties that make it not only really useful for the end consumer, but as this deregulation is coming in, it makes it a great asset to use in your free market enterprise. Okay, so back to this fateful HNG Inner North board meeting in Omaha in, uh, I think this is now 1986, 1985 or 1986. Skilling, the hotshot McKinsey consultant, is sitting there in the waiting room, getting ready to go present to management and the board when the prior CEO, the number one, member Lay is number two after the merger, walks out and informs Skilling that he's going to keep on going because he has just been fired by the board and Lay has engineered the coup that Lay is now the CEO of the company. So uh, they don't really have much time for the headquarters discussion in this board meeting. And what time they do have, the board is like, no, obviously we're keeping it in Omaha and, you know, Lay's the consummate politician. He knows better than to press his luck. Like he just got what he wanted. He's not going to fight with his new board at this board meeting. To the very end for Ken Lay, I don't think he ever said anything in a public or pseudo public context that was confrontational or pissed anybody off. To the very bitter end. So the headquarters move does not happen at that meeting. It does happen shortly thereafter. But this is where Skilling and Lay meet for the first time. And uh, Lay comes out in his very you know, sort of politician manner after the board meeting is over. He apologizes to Skilling for all the drama. He says, you know, look, I've read your work on the study. You really did an excellent, excellent job. Like, I would love to keep the relationship going with you and McKinsey. We're going to have a lot of work to do at this combined company. I want you to be our McKinsey partner back in Houston, who's going to lead a whole bunch of strategic initiatives for us. Yes. So it begins. And so it begins. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Who got the truth now? Hmm. 